talk today about web literacy and Mozilla's whole idea around building a generation of web makers, what we're doing about it and why. So first off, about Mozilla. Mozilla is not just any ordinary software organization. It's an organization with a mission. And that mission is to guard the open nature of the internet. That's what we set out to do when we first started out in 2003. And the first project we had towards that mission was to keep the core technical building blocks of the web alive. The web is based on HTML, CSS, JavaScript, as well as sitting on top of the internet. And we saw at that moment a need to keep those core technologies, which are free to anyone to build on, alive and vibrant. Because they were at threat. They were at threat because they were stagnating inside of Internet Explorer 6, which was the really the only game in town with 98% of market share on the internet. And how we tackled that first project was by building a browser that millions of people around the world would love. We didn't tackle that project by jumping up and down and screaming. We decided to build software that embedded our values in it, embedded the ideas that we wanted to make real in the world. And so let's just step a little bit back in time for that project. Here's a diagram of browser market share between 2002 and 2009. And you can see it changes a lot. If we go back to 2002, it's all blue. It's all Internet Explorer. 98% of the, the web browsers in use are Internet Explorer, are Microsoft. And what's happening at that time is Microsoft really is letting the core building blocks of the web, those programming languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, stagnate inside of Internet Explorer 6. Just remember how hard it was to, to do webmail back then. You had to constantly reload. The web was not an interesting place. It was also full of pop-ups and viruses and all of those kinds of things. And Microsoft wasn't investing in fixing that problem. It was just letting the web sit there. And to the degree that it was bringing programming and apps into the web, it was doing it by pushing its own technology, ActiveX. And then let's think 2009. What's changed? We're no longer in a monopoly situation, and certainly this is even more so the case today with, uh, you know, with Chrome and Safari as well as Firefox. But by 2009, you can see the orange part. Firefox has come and it's taken a huge chunk of the market share from Internet Explorer, which isn't interesting in its own right. It's interesting because a browser, a product with the values of the web, with the idea of keeping the web open, with the idea of embedding the best of those core technologies, those core building blocks of the web, is there as a major player in the market. And by becoming a major player in the market, it brings the web back to life. You start to see Ajax, you start to see things like Gmail or Facebook or rich applications on the web, you start to, to see innovation. So we see a shift in the market, and that's something that is because Firefox decides to come out as a great product with a set of values in. So what does that actually mean for real people, though? So NICE, a nonprofit, a community sets up, displaces a big company, gives people choice between browsers. But ultimately, what does it matter for the internet? What does it matter for people? Well, one of the things that, that matters is that it's no longer the case that you know, people are writing web pages, web apps, just for one browser. If you think back to 2003, you would have seen this online app only available for Internet Explorer all the time. You never see it anymore. What that means is because of Firefox and the other modern browsers that have followed it, the web on the desktop is a truly cross-platform place. Now that sounds silly and unimportant, but what it means is, I mean, to, to some people it might sound silly and unimportant, but what it means is that we actually have an open platform that anyone can build anything on without asking permission from anybody and without being tied to anyone's particular technologies. We've never had that in the history of computing, and in some ways there, there's many things in that, which is permissionless publishing by anyone who can get a URL that we've never had before in human history. We have this huge, open, democratic system that allows people to create wealth, to create art, whatever they want. And we were going in the other direction before 2003. So that's a big deal. And of course, you know, people do silly things with that. You know, I, I think it, I can have cheeseburger memes, you know, trivial, but a part of the, the vibrancy of a different culture that we've actually built through the web 
where everyone is able to express their ideas, no matter you know if others think that they're they're silly. That's the web that we've rebuilt through Firefox. And frankly, while I may have issues with Facebook, we've also built the created the building box where rich applications can be built, like Facebook, that have all kinds of interactivity, all kinds of social. Now there's new things, new problems that come when we start to create silos and walled gardens. But it is that we brought back the modern web, that we got out of that stagnation, that we got out of the idea of Microsoft controlling the web stack, the building blocks of the web, that is the real victory behind Firefox. And that is Mozilla going after its mission with product. Now, it's not interesting only that Mozilla knows how to go after its mission with product, but also that it goes after it in a different way. We work in a totally different way than almost any organization on the planet, but certainly than almost any other software company. Firefox is built by people who don't just work for Mozilla. In fact, when we started out as an organization, there were really just 10 employees and hundreds or thousands of volunteers. And as you can see, you've still got hundreds of thousands of beta testers, you know, tens of thousands of people every night testing new builds of Firefox. We've got student volunteers, we've got localizers, so in that 400 or 500 million total users of Firefox, there still is a community of people who contribute every day to making it. And that way of working is something that sets Mozilla apart and ties back to that mission of guarding the open nature of the internet. Mozilla's way of working in some ways exemplifies what we believe the internet brings to humanity. It is a way of collaborating, a way of communities building real value for each other, and a way of building freedom. And of course, those people aren't just a pie chart. They aren't just that diagram. Here is the, you know, a huge chunk of the Mozilla community, about half of whom in this picture are volunteers at Whistler a couple years ago. It is these people who brought you Firefox and these people who brought back the web from the brink of being a much more boring, broken, closed down system to something which today is vibrant and wonderful. So, you know, it, it's not just though the desktop where the web matters, and it's not just about a browser. And so looking at our mission over the last year or two, people in Mozilla have said, we need to take our mission beyond the browser. We need to not just be making Firefox on the desktop. We need to be thinking about other things. And so the desktop is clearly the core of it, and it's where we've seen a victory, where we've seen real cross-platform computing and networking. But we need to bring that to mobile, where it's broken right now, where we see an oligopoly of distribution amongst a few vendors who control what apps get published and where we aren't across platforms and we don't have uh, you know, the, the same open under the hood technology as the web across everything. So you know, Mozilla's decided we want to fix that. We're working on something called Firefox OS, which will come out this year. And we also care though that people understand the web. When it, the web first came out, there was a sense that anyone could make a web page. It's now become complex hard to see under the hood, but more importantly, most people don't understand the full power of what they have in their hands in the web. And we want them to understand that power. And that's when we start talking about web literacy, a piece that really is important to Mozilla. And I'm gonna talk about that more today than, than anything else in detail because it's a piece that I'm really passionate about and I'm really trying to help Mozilla build up. And so we started something called Mozilla Webmaker as a peer to Firefox OS and Firefox with the goal of moving tens of millions of people from using the web to making the web, to understanding, to being literate in the full power of what the web can bring them. So what do I mean by web literacy? Well, I kind of have hinted at this so far, but you know, what I like to, to do when I describe how the web works is to say the World Wide Web is made of Lego. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna use my son, Ethan, who's 11 now, he just turned 11, to help explain that idea. So Ethan loves to make things with Lego. He likes to take them apart, put them back together, make different things, make stuff from one Lego set, combined with another Lego set, combined with another Lego set. He loves that. And you know, we can all imagine how fun that is and understand what it is. It's something which by design is meant to be taken apart, understood, and recombined. Ethan also loves the web. He loves it a lot. It's where he spends more time than with Lego these days. And he loves trashy, mainstream internet culture, although by the, the standards of MTV or Ed Sullivan from my generation, my parents' generation, 
it's, it's actually pretty independent. But he loves stuff like Rebecca Black. It's stuff that he comes in and shows me. And he loves that just as much as, as Lego. He loves that YouTube culture. But even more, he loves stuff like this. This is Chad Vader, who's just a guy in a Darth Vader mask, making fun of Rebecca Black, doing a read mix. And you know, Ethan loves that stuff. It's what he comes and he shows me, Daddy, have you seen this? That's the mainstream culture Ethan lives in. And it's actually a very different culture than the one I grew up in. And, and I don't know how old you are, but that many of you may have grown up in. Because Ethan's world is a remix. It's one that isn't just about something coming from me from, from afar, a piece of software, a movie. It's about something where he knows he could be the author and where he's seeing people iterate and riff off each other all the time, which to me is central to the culture the web has built. And it's, it's interesting because it's central to the, the culture we built in the web by design. It's built in thoughtfully that the web is about Lego and Remix and taking things apart, understanding them, and putting them back together. Tim Berners-Lee wanted the web to work like Lego when he invented it, when he kind of put the concept forward originally at CERN. And you know, he invented something which he may have never thought was going to replace MTV or the main TV networks, which YouTube too clearly has. Um, but I, I'm sure he's proud of that. And the people who are all the pioneers of the web, you know, while it may be a mixed bag, are, are proud of that. But the thing that I think they're also proud of, and the thing that they built in by design, is not just a way to put videos on the web, but a way to actually see what is underneath. That's the Lego. Here's the HTML code. Here's the, the scripts. Here is what makes the web work underneath. And still today with any web browser, I can go in and see that Lego. Now some of it is harder to see because it's more complicated than it used to be. But this is what the web is made of. Code that anyone can understand using languages owned by nobody that allow us to express ourselves, to make things, to start a business, to start a project, to create art without asking for anybody. And it's, it's there underneath. It's not like a magazine or television. That is the design of the web. The web was designed to be like Lego. And so I think that's important because that is at the core of the innovation and the creativity we've seen and the wealth that we've seen created in the first 20 years of the web. And I want Ethan to know this. I want him to know the web is made by Lego. I want him to know that the web is made of Lego and I want him to understand how it works. I want him to know the full power so he can make the web what he wants, whether he decides to be an artist or a doctor or an engineer. I think there's a tremendous power and actually a need for our next generation to know how the web works. And this is what I mean by web literacy. So why does it matter? Why do we care about web literacy? Well, you know, luckily a lot of people have started talking about this question. Here's Ed Vasey, the Minister of Culture in the UK, which is a place I spend a lot of time and a place where the, the WebMaker program is really starting to, to get some traction. And he says, a basic understanding of computer coding will help you understand the structure of your digital life. And I think that's the core of it. We're not talking about some arcane punch card world where there are specialists needed to run computers. Computers are a part of our everyday life. The web is a part of our everyday life. Understanding how it works is absolutely essential to understand the structure of that life and not understanding how it works is being somebody who doesn't know how to read or somebody who doesn't know how to write in a world made of language. And so to me, really understanding the web is like having a fourth literacy, like reading, like writing, like math. We need to understand that digital world. We need to be able to write the world that we live in, which is digital. And there is another piece of it, and this is another UK report uh, on kind of the games industry that came out from Nesta, talking about that we're losing by not embracing an understanding of the digital, uh, a cutting edge economically, which I think is true, although I think it's secondary to the everyday life piece. And there's also a number of arguments coming forward that it's time to put computer science and coding into schools. And this is the Royal Society in the UK that's made this point, and you're starting to see traction to that idea. And yes, true, we do need to do that. And that's one of the important things to consider. But to me, the biggest piece, and it goes back to the original Ed Vasey quote a few seconds ago, is we need to be thinking about digital skills, learning to code, understanding the web as something for every young person. 
every young person should have the experience of making digital products and not just using them. And this is something in the Nesta report where they're looking at digital making that they point out. And I agree completely. This really has to be about every young person understanding how the Lego works. Now that sounds like a huge job, a uh, huge job, especially if you wanted to do it through schools. But the good news is 56%, including Ethan, 56% of internet users already create or curate content online in some way. They're already at the edge of being makers. Now, they don't understand the full power of the web necessarily, and I would argue actually almost, you know, most of them don't. They just do simple things that are kind of packaged up and handed to them. There's nothing to give them roadmaps and to give them signs that there's something more powerful here. But there's a starting point, there's an impulse. I think that that is the foundation for widespread web literacy. That the people who are making memes, that the people who are taking photos on their cameras, even, you know, people who are, and especially people who are a part of the kind of maker movement, putting up blogs online, and to some degree, some big segment of people who are on Facebook, we have a starting point with them. They're comfortable with the technology, they're magnetically drawn to the technology, and they're expressing themselves through the technology. And what we need to do is say, there's another 95% of what the web can do for you here that is more powerful, that gives you the chance to do anything you can imagine, and we want to show you how to do it as a part of the things you're already expressing online. And so that then kind of brings a question. So we want people to understand the full power of the web. How do we do that? How do we teach web literacy at scale? And that's what WebMaker is aiming to do. We want tens of millions, and I would actually argue hundreds of millions of people, to move from using the web to making the web. And we launched a very early piece of that uh, in June, the Mozilla or webmaker.org, Mozilla's webmaker.org website, which inside of it includes a bunch of kind of starter projects where you can go and learn, make things, uh, and as you do it, learn how they work. And so, you know, learning how to make uh, complex interactive videos and learning more about the web as you go, learning HTML and CSS, and so on. And as a part of those kind of maker projects, we've also embedded a set of tools. Thimble for learning HTML, X-ray goggles for just kind of like hacking around with web pages and learning how they work and remixing them, and Popcorn, which is an advanced video tool that lets you pull content from all around the web uh, and make it feel like a video and make something new and then remix it with your friends. And that actually is the one that I think is going to have a tremendous potential because it's simple to use, but also shows you what it's like to pull from across the web and use that Lego set. And so, as I said, Thimble is the, the HTML editing piece of it. You can pull projects out from inside of that and get started. An example, and I think this is the kind of thing you'll see more and more of, that we need to do more and more of as a part of WebMaker, is a meme generator. You know, it's something, it, it's funny, I actually use it all the time because it's a fast way for me to make a meme just with an image URL from the web and typing in here. And so, you know, this is just a quick way to make a meme and pop it out, which is something lots of people want to do every day. Uh, but as it does it, it throws you right into the HTML and Thimble, where you can edit it and see it change. And you have to kind of understand a little bit about how HTML works, or teach yourself, which is what the code comments do here, about how HTML works in order to make that meme. So that's the idea behind WebMaker. Let's get people doing things, making things through these projects every day that they want to make anyways, that are probably a part of the core internet popular culture, but do it in a way that expo exposes them to the Lego. Do it in a way that exposes them to how the web works. And another example is in Popcorn, we've got sort of this uh, pop-up video generator which lets you play with, uh, play on top of, of other videos, including popular culture videos. And that's a little bit different. This is an old version of, of Popcorn, but it's something where you're, you're in something that feels like iMovie, but what you're doing is you're actually pulling lots of content just from URLs and from APIs across the web. And that's a very different thing because it teaches you that you can make it something that's a, you know, very common and desired commodity on the web, a video, out of the Lego blocks of stuff spread across the internet. And we think that'll be a really good way well, A, we think it'll be popular. We think people will like popcorn, will like the idea of pulling things from across the video, the internet and making videos out of them and then sharing them again on Facebook or Tumblr. But we also think it's a way that as people do that, they'll get the sense, ah, I understand this le these Lego blocks. I want to do more. And of course, you know, over time, we'll probably do things like combine 
Fimble or Popcorn with our Firefox mobile, and who knows what will happen. The point of this is we want to start with projects, start with content, uh, all of these um, kind of core pieces of what people want to make on the web, pull them together with tools that make it easy to make things while teaching you how the web works, and go from there. And that's what Mozilla WebMaker is at its most tangible. Mozilla WebMaker is also about something that you know, Mozilla believes deeply in, which is building a movement for web literacy. We know, you just go back to making Firefox, it is all about people who are excited, who are empowered, and who can get under the hood and see how the technology works. And so that's something that we want to uh, dive into as we look at this question of web literacy, getting people, hundreds of millions, or at least you know, tens of millions of people involved in teaching each other to make on the web. And you know, I take a lot of inspiration from the scouting movement uh, in figuring that we can do a movement at that scale. You know, when scouting started out, uh, you know, the, the things that it did were not common. In fact, the major social innovation that scouting came along with was camping. At the time, at the, the turn of the, the 20th century, nobody except for the military camped. Just like very few people other than engineers make software today. But what scouting did was it made camping into something that was popular for everyday, normal, urban young people. And through that actually engendered an understanding of both the technical skills of camping, the enjoyment of camping, but also the, the deeper appreciation of nature and, and ultimately the political issues behind uh, nature and the environment. And so if you just think about moving from camping being professionalized to camping to be a mainstream consumer civilian activity that hundreds of millions of people do and connects them to nature, it doesn't seem so hard to imagine we would do the same thing with software and the web. And it also doesn't seem so hard to imagine that we would build a movement to do that. Even today, there's 40 million scouts and guides worldwide. Those are people who stand for the environment, the connection for nature, and do it by organizing as volunteers. We think we can do the same thing with the web. Mozilla knows how to do this. We don't know how to do it alone, but we believe that web literacy is so critical, that keeping the web open is so critical, that we absolutely have to look at that scale. But more importantly, we think people love the web so much, it's not hard to think about that scale. Showing other people how the web works, showing them how to make something delightful, that's great, people love it. This summer, we actually did something called the Summer Code Party where we asked people to do exactly that. Just show people how to make something on the web. And with very little effort, only a few staff, we had 650 events around the world in over 80 different countries, all run by volunteers. There is a thirst and passion to bring the web to alive for people, to teach people how powerful the web is. And that's the movement that we want to help build. It won't just be us, but it will definitely be something that we will drive. And, you know, that sounds like a big and grandiose thing, but just as with Firefox, and as I said a moment ago, that's just about people getting together in a room, at least to start. And so here's the Summer Code Party event in Taiwan, and this is what it looks like. It just looks like normal kids and grown-ups showing each other how to make stuff on the web, often kids showing adults how to make stuff on the web, uh, in a way that uh, feels familiar and comfortable. We can get to something huge that builds on this feeling of passion for the web and on the familiar and the com comfortable. And part of that, of course, is not just working with Mozilla, as I just said. We've started to work with lots of other partners around the world. And this is a, a webmaker session run by Think Big School, which is Telefonica's kind of school and entrepreneurship and youth empowerment program in the UK. And we want to see, and are already starting to see, dozens of organizations like Telefonica or people who, who are kind of on the ground like uh, Apps for Good and Young Rewired State in the UK being a part of this movement and building something huge where everyone knows how to code, where we have this massive movement for web literacy and building on things like WebMaker and so on, where we have tools that are designed, we have an everyday internet experience that is designed to open the hood to learn, to make, to tinker, and to have the web be our own. Thanks very much, and if you want to get involved in building a generation of web makers, really uh, feel free to reach out, webmaker.org, or find me on Twitter, msermon. Thanks very much.